Today's uh, lesson is called Concerning Power. Uh, that is, of course, uh, the worst world play, word play in the whole wide world um, from, from the Lord of the Rings, as is everything else that isn't from Dune. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, power in riding in all its uh, shapes and all its different concerns. Um, we're going to uh, go through impulsion. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to make your horse appear powerful be powerful, how to be powerful yourself, and uh, we are going to make sure to tell everyone who wants to know that um, power isn't something that resides in your hand. It uh, lies in completely different areas, um, some of them physical and uh, some of them mental or even emotional. Um, I believe even Don Duarte talked about this in his treatise on horseback riding. Um, the first thing I've been asked to, uh, to say something about is impulsion. Um, impulsion, or uh, in this, uh, I will try and, and relate this also to what the Germans call Schwung, um, which I see as at least two sides of the same thing, if they aren't exactly the same. Uh, we're going to go through what, what impulsion is, um, how it should feel, uh, what it shouldn't feel like, how it is quite often misunderstood, in my opinion, um, and uh, try and try and give a rounded view and idea about what it is, so that it is possible to create it yourself, or at least possible to ask the ask some good questions about what it is, so you can progress your own writing. Um, we will start with impulsion and schwung, uh, and. What we, what we see with impulsion is that it is, the, it is um, what you need in order to get to collection. Uh, you need it also in order to see whether your horse is straight or not. Um, the horse is straight if it carries and pushes off the same with both hind legs. And impulsion is pushing off with the hind leg without it only be running. Because um, you can see that uh, horses have a good push-off with the hind leg, even the, the warm blood trotters have a really good push-off with their hind legs, but it is extremely difficult to use it riding-wise for anything other than trot as fast as you can at least, which is our concern, to not trot as fast as we can, but rather to use the power for something else. Use the power for carriage, and uh, therefore also use the use the power to to um, uh, maneuver in all sorts of ways. It can be maneuvering for uh, for the um, what do you call that eventing, or it can be maneuvering uh, in the jumping field, or it can be maneuvering in your dressage tests, or as I like to do when you're fighting somewhere else on horseback. Um, like I said, the impulsion starts from the hind legs, but that's not where we start trying to build impulsion. Uh, I tried to start Im building impulsion from the hind legs only, with all the aids I had that could um, engage the hindquarters. Uh, and I did that for many, many years, and I got pretty good at uh, not being correct in it. <laughs> but still being able to have the horse jump around on his haunches, but I wasn't able to transition it into a good medium um, gait, like a medium canter or a medium trot or any such thing, so the transitions were very difficult. For me personally, that led to um, that I had to always accelerate through the hit when I was jousting, for instance. So it was very difficult to get a, uh, get a good and steady pace for the jousting, and also, of course, if you try to do the same thing, you can, if you accelerate all the while, all the whole diagonal when you're doing your trot or canter extensions, you shouldn't accelerate all the time. You accelerate up to an extended gait, and then you keep going from that position. So, uh, my hunt for impulsion uh, went then to trying to influence the horse's back in some way or other. 
And this was for me uh, more or less impossible to understand for the best part of 20 years, I would say. And then finally I was able to uh, see it and be told how to at the same time. And that's when I was able to start moving in the correct way and then moving through the hips. It is not some leg thing or some hand thing or some swaying the back thing, but rather moving through the hips in a weird sort of circle. And that released the power that I had been able to always create, but never to release it in a soft manner. I could sort of turn the power to full, or I could turn the power all the way off, but I could never keep it in the middle. And now I'm able to keep it in the middle. And after that happened, my horses have uh, built much more muscle. Uh, they are much more calm to work with. And at the same time, they're more powerful when I want to turn around and do other, other stuff. So in my opinion, um, power starts with releasing the horses back. And when that's properly released, then you need to start controlling how the horse feels. And how you control it is what we're going to get at as this evening goes on. As my, uh, maybe my local bunch of people has anything to ask yet? No? They are, became oysters, actually, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Tricked them anyway. <laughs> Well, that's good. They're more, more nervous than I am. That's good. Good. To, good to know. So there are only two people here, other than me, obviously. Um, so, so um, this power thing, uh, I'm first going to relate it to how I use power in riding, and I'm not talking about the horse's power. And I'm not talking about pulling with my, my reins. And I'm not talking about kicking the horse in the sides. That's not where you need power. In my opinion, you need power for roughly three things when you ride. This might be uh, not pleasant to watch, so you're warned. One thing is to move forward through your hips that way. I won't do it again. <laughs> the second thing is to keep your balance on the stirrup you need to keep your balance on and of course as you would probably all get the little light in your head saying oh but you should be balanced on both yes you should be but if your horse isn't completely straight that's not uh, the case and what we see most times is that the saddle is sla slanted to one side or another a little bit especially if you work circles or if you work sideways mo movements and you have to be able to control whether the saddle moves to one side or the other. This is true in a static sense, but it is also true in a dynamic sense. So that what you have to do is to weight the stirrup you need weighted. So for instance, in a left turn, quite a lot of horses are stiff in the left hind. And if they are engaged from the hind, which they might not be, but if they are, then they will quite often be able to flip your hips and your saddle to the outside. And then you're sitting like this and you think everything is fine and perky, but your body isn't straight anymore. So you need power to move forward through the hips like I showed. The next piece of power you need is in the midsection, in the sides here. The somewhat soft sides. <laughs> so, that, so that you can keep your hips oriented in the right direction. If one or the other gives in, then your hip will cave in to one or the other side like that. So we will have to get into straightness as well, but I'm going to try and keep to my three little power things first. So moving forward through the hip, keeping your weight on the correct stirrup so that you have to have your hip moving in several directions at the same time. So this way, this way, and this way. Hips have to be able to move. And it is very easy that the horse is so strong, and he doesn't do this on purpose, he's just stiff and strong, and then he will 
tilt your body to one side and then the other hip will take all the, all the weight and you become stiff. Quite often you become stiff on the inside of the, of the, inside, of the inside thigh. Look at that, that's great. Uh, so that muscle grows stiff and if, it is, if you're strong enough you don't have to grow stiff. This is, a, this is a sort of a weird paradox of power. The stronger you are, the easier it is for you to keep soft and relaxed. Uh, you, can, you can try this yourself. You can pick up something that's really heavy and try to put it very smoothly down on your mother's or daughter's uh, glass table. See, see how that goes for you. Don't, don't drop it. Uh, or you can pick up something really light and put it down. So it's, it's such the body works such that if it is allowed to work on a very low power output it is, it is uh, able to be very very gentle and very sensitive but it, if you have to work on a very high power output level so that you work on a high level compared to your maximum if this is your maximum and you're working very close to that it is very difficult to also be smooth in your movements so that's why some sort of power is needed in the body. I don't mean you need to be a powerlifter, even if I think that's fun. <laughs> that doesn't mean you have to be a powerlifter. And I, when I tell people you should train, the point isn't that you need to train until you have like a six pack on the outside instead of on the inside, <coughs> like some of us do. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you have to become big and bulky and strong. It means that if you train like that, you will train at being smooth while working hard which is what we're trying to do so that even if your muscles are working very close to the maximum up there somewhere you will still be able to move smoothly so those three things being able to move forward being able to be stable in the hip sideways and being able to be stable in the midsection those things are necessary in order to be able to ride with power. Because if you lack one of them, the back of the horse will become stiff. And that stiffness or tenseness in the back won't be overcome by the impulsion from behind. So it, what's going to happen then is that instead of the horse being able to keep his back more or less flat as he kicks off, he's going to kick off and become sway-backed. And that means that the power moves the wrong way through the back. It needs to move this way through the back. It doesn't need to move that way through the back. This is important to get good uh, grades when you ride your, um, your uh, dressage tests, if you're going to do it correctly. But it is also important uh, if you're jumping, for instance, for, uh, for uh, what is it called? When you jump a high... Uh, a high obstacle, uh, the horse needs to do a good bascule, it means that the back rounds over the obstacle, right? That's the same feeling or idea that you need in every stride in your horse. And that, it is not difficult to understand, in my opinion, that if your horse does that little up through the back in every stride, then the only thing you need to do is to turn that up a little bit and then it will jump, right? While if it goes down every stride and then you're going to jump. You have to change your whole pattern of movement before jumping off. And that makes it very difficult. So riding with power doesn't mean that the horse needs to feel electric. It doesn't mean that you need to be extremely strong. It doesn't mean that you're going to pull or kick at the horse. It means just a set of thoughts in your head that will balance the saddle no matter how the horse moves. If you're able to balance the saddle in all dimensions, then you will be able also to ride the horse with power. That was a long monologue. I'm going to have to need a couple of seconds to think about that. Any questions? Good. Interesting? Oh, these people think it's interesting, so I'm not going to stop yet. We're just silently nodding. Silently <laughs> nodding. That's what they're doing, actually. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Sometimes I feel I'm floating mm -hmm. over the horse, and the horse is 
anger and polarity. Is that the feeling you're talking about? All right. So uh, I will repeat the question. And uh, one of my friends here, he says that sometimes he feels like he floats over the horse and the horse just follows him wherever he moves. Um, I would say this is the right feeling. I cannot say, obviously, that it is what you're feeling when that's happening, because I can't see you doing it right now, so it, it's impossible to answer it perfectly, but the idea is something to that extent. Um, that's a very good question, and it leads me to be able to go on in a, in a fairly good way, I think. So, most of us have heard that we should follow the horse's movement perfectly, or at least follow the horse's movement, or to some extent, <laughs> follow the horse. <laughs> but the, uh, what we're actually looking to do is not to follow the horse's movement, because that would mean that the horse decides where you're supposed to go. Uh, that is a way you could ride, uh, and for, for many purposes that works just fine, but that's not what we are talking about. It, I'm not saying this is right, and that is wrong. I'm saying this is what I'm talking about and this other stuff is something else. For instance, some horses that have a very good cow sense can do very nice cutting, uh, like cutting some calves out of the, of the herd on their own. And the rider better tag along or he will fall off. And the, then in those cases the horse will decide where to go and that is a good thing in those cases if you're able to not fall off. Yes? I'm just asking uh, Hege Hege's question. And she's asking... Could you wait for... Yep. till just I'm done with the yep. m my short thing? So, um, when we... What I'm talking about here is that you should move first, or at least in here, you do the movement and the horse follows that movement, not the other way around. So, it is not the cow sense idea, it is you who need to do this. This can be seen in quite a lot of, of really good riders. It can be seen in, uh, in training really good uh, jumping riders, for instance, um, or eventing riders. And quite often there, you're told something to the, to the effect of just throw your heart over first and the horse will jump the obstacle just fine. That's the same idea. You jump first and the horse will jump after. It's the same idea that we're talking about here. We have a question. Asking how you balance the saddle. How I balance the saddle. Mm -hmm. All right. So the idea here is the fundamental idea is that the saddle isn't something that is uh, just supposed to be so hard stuck on the horse that you can balance on the saddle. So you're not supposed to be stuck to the saddle, and then um, and then also. Uh, be, what do you call that, um, be bound to whatever the saddle is doing. That's not the idea. It's the same thought that we just explained, really. So what I do to balance the saddle is, first, I get my weight to fall around from the hips and all the way down to the legs, all the way down to the feet. So I feel like I'm balancing on my toes as if I'm standing on my toes on the edge of a set of stairs. So I'm not standing on the toes, but if this is the ball of my foot, I will put the ball of the foot on the stirrup, and then I'll sort of think as if I'm, uh, my toes are about this long, so <coughs> I'm a little bit of a monkey. So I grab around the stirrup just softly. I just let the, the toes fall around the stirrup while I balance on the balls of my feet on the stirrup. You can do this all the way and stand above the horse, as I know Hege has done quite a lot in her trot, for instance. That is one way to think about balancing the horse with the saddle. So you're balancing the saddle by way of balancing the stirrups about the same height from the ground all the time. That is one of the ways you balance the saddle. One of the other ways you balance the saddle is in this plane, where the saddle 
will have to move like this when the horse moves, especially at a canter, at a trot and a walk. It's a weirdo movement that I'm not even going to try and talk about more about, but the canter movement, something like that. You have to release that movement through your hips. If you look at someone doing... Um, oh, the word escaped me. When, uh, when they sit on horses that balk a whole lot and then they fall off. Rodeo riders, thank you guys. Uh, when you, when you, if you watch those rodeo riders, you will see that they release completely at the hip when the horse bucks, and they also release at the lower back. You're not allowed to do that, only at the hip, because your lower back is going to release anyway. So focus on releasing through the hip. So you allow the saddle to move freely by moving forward through your hip. You're allowing the saddle to move forward like this. Just a second. Please, come out, come out, whoever you are. Move along. Just the kids moving through. So, you balance the saddle, those two directions, first and foremost, from side to side, by keeping the stirrups the same height from the ground. That's one idea of how you look at it. Uh, and the other way is to make sure the saddle can move freely forward through your legs. Then we hope that answers Hege's question. And uh, Hege is, of course, free to ask more. So, um, another way to think about that, uh, that balancing the saddle sideways, is um, to... Uh, this and the uh, thanks goes out to Arian de Jong. Uh, he said that, oh, it's just like having those Iron Man boots on. And I'm like, what? Uh, watch the movie, Iron Man, if you haven't already. It's, uh, you can consider it uh, part of your curriculum. Uh, <laughs> when you put on some rocket boots, you have to balance those pretty nicely, or, uh, or they will put you in uh, weird directions. The same thing applies to horses that are really well ridden. You need to keep your weight focused downwards, or the horse will go in weird directions, and, and so will you. And I think that more or less answers Hege's question. So get, your, get yourself some Iron Man boots, Hege, that'll, that'll do. All right. Just a few uh, short seconds. You had something, some idea? Well, what you're doing is, uh, because now you haven't talked about power, have you? Or in Are we out of sound? No, I can hear it. Good. So we're all good then? Good to go? Mm -hmm. Is it good to ride with a loose girth? To run down. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, the, answer? the answer is uh, um, uh, neither yes nor no. Uh, it is a learning experience to ride <laughs> with a very loose girth. Sometimes that learning experience can be really steep. <coughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend riding with a loose girth. Don't do it unless you know precisely what you're doing. Um, the idea with trying to keep the saddle straight is of course not to keep the saddle straight. It is to keep the horse straight. It's just that if you try to, if you try to wrap your head around the whole thing, keeping the horse straight, it's really difficult. While, while trying to keep the stirrups about the same height of the ground, that's not that hard to focus on. Uh, and it is much easier to explain than to try and explain the feeling, which is really hard because everyone has a different idea of how to, how to express the correct feeling. So have I. I've got different ideas for every time I ride it. <laughs> so it's, it's really difficult. But uh, try with a loose girth if you like. I'm not recommending it. Uh, not because it isn't a learning experience, but because it might be a very, very harsh learning experience. So that's my answer to that question. All right, so we have, we have talked now about power in the rider and what the power in the rider is used for. The power in the rider is used in order to counter the horse's uh, sorry? Crookedness. crookedness. Thank you. So um, the next idea is that we have to be able to create power in the horse as well. 
Uh, and creating power in the horse is both deceptively easy and deceptively difficult. The first thing I would like people to think about and maybe even understand when it comes to power in the horse is that let us let us take a, a, an example. If I try to pull a new personal record deadlift or squat a new personal record some sort of squat, I will put my weight on the shoulders, I will bend down and whenever I can't get all the way down but when I turn around and start lifting back up I will feel anything but explosive and powerful. Normally I will just feel weak and slow. That's what happens when you power out of the bottom of that movement to the best of your abilities. You will not feel very fast, you will not feel very powerful and the movement will definitely be slow. Um, the reason I want to start with this is that quite often when when we see quite often when you ride you will feel that the horse is very energetic and it is very easy to confuse that with power and that energetic feel that electrical uh, jerky movements feeling in the horse that's not power in the way we're trying to express it here that is tension and of course tension and power are just two sides of the same thing uh, it is tension if the movement doesn't work perfectly the way you wanted it to and it is power if it works perfectly the way you intended it to. So uh, whenever the horse becomes um, erratic, uh, unrhythmical, um, electric, jerky, all that sort of thing in his movements, whenever your ass leaves the saddle to some extent, then it isn't power. Of course, it can still be fairly good or even very good, but it isn't power in the purest sense that we're talking about here. You have lost some of it, obviously, and it has become tension instead. Quite often, if you try to just put in a little bit of power, it's not enough, and it becomes just... Uh, it falls apart, and then it is also tense. And quite often, there will be too much power, and the horse becomes tense, and then you become tense, and then the ball will s the snowball in the wrong direction if you're not really good at collecting your own thoughts and your own emotions. So this power thing, this impulsion that we want in the horse, it is, we have to look at it as an ideal high up there somewhere. And this ideal is something that we hope for and we strive for and you might be trying to ride with power even if it feels a little bit too jerky you have to just make sure that you're trying to get the jerkiness away you need to feel that the horse isn't electric but still if you were to move forward through your hips with power the horse will do the same move forward through his hips with power her with power that's what we're trying to achieve so that power means that you have to have a strong neck, you have to have strong back, you have to have the horse loose through the withers and you have to have the horse really engaged from behind. And that all of those things are really difficult. Even if you, <laughs> if you take it apart and do one, it's really difficult. So if, um, if you think that you haven't quite managed to get the power yet, you're probably right. Uh, if you think that you have managed, um, you might be right, <laughs> but it's really difficult. So make sure that you ask yourself, question yourself all the time. Don't question your self-worth, just question your, the, what you're actually managing to do. So the power in the horse starts like this. If you're seated on the horse, and the horse is to your hand, or hands, depending. And your horse is in some sort of an outline, and the horse is lifting his mouth forward to your hand, so you can just feel the, the mouth, but it's not pulling, and you're not pulling because you're obviously sitting quite still, 
not falling through your midsection, not stiffening in your hips. If you now put your legs on, the horse should move forward hind leg first. If it doesn't, it isn't power. Full stop. Just test it. Not now, but afterwards. Or tomorrow. So the idea is that the hind leg must move forward first. And this is also a quality thing. It's not a quantity that it, it, it doesn't work like this. If the hind leg moves first, then it is power. But it is definite that if the front leg moves first, it is not power. So what happens is quite often, if you move forward and you hold your hand still, you don't give the hand when you walk forward, you just make the horse walk from behind. If he tries with his hind leg first, most likely he will fall out or he will fall in instead of moving forward. And the reason for that is that the outside hind doesn't want to bend because that's hard, tough for the muscles to carry all the weight on that hind leg and then the next hind leg has to move in carriage and then it's all hard and it's tough work and the horse says, nah, I would rather save my energy for later on and keep my hind legs straight, thank you very much. So that whole power thing starts with a very, very simple movement. Move forward. It's not easy. It's just simple. It's one, easy, one simple thing to do and nothing about it is easy because everything there has so much potential for being the wrong quality that it is a little bit annoying actually. Mostly funny but annoying too. So the power in the horse starts in that short movement. Right. Any questions? How I make my, the aids to make the horse move with power. All right, so we have set the stage for this already. I told you that the person riding needs to be powerful or needs to think in terms of power to make this work. And that comes into play here. If I ask now the horse to move forward, normally most people will put the leg on by kicking up so they lift their leg from this joint shortening these muscles and then that makes the the calf and heel come in contact with the horse and that's supposed to make the horse move the problem with this is that you have already now locked the hip from being able to move forward at the same time there's not it's not been locked forever and ever <laughs> it's just locked in this moment it needs to move this way in the first movement. You need to move your legs this way to be able to move the fo horse forward like that. So that's all the aids you need in order to <laughs> ride with power and then just repeat it all the time and then take some breaks. I've, I was told once that uh, you shouldn't collect the horse all the time. It's a good idea. Relax the horse very often and collect sometimes. Just think about it like this. How much time do you actually spend doing your heavy squat sets? No? And if you don't know, look it up on the mighty YouTube. They know everything about squats. Everything wrong and everything right, I believe, <laughs> actually. So the only thing you have to do is to make sure you can move your legs and hips at the, in the right way at the correct time. The correct time is when the horse is ready, and when you want to. Those two things, when you want to, that's really important. It needs to be when you want to, it needs to not be when the horse wants to. Because if it is when the horse wants to, it isn't you leading the movement, it is the horse leading the movement. Those two things are sometimes like the, two, the opposite sides of the same card, so it's sort of the same thing almost. You can, you can bring the uh, horse moves first all the way to that card and you can bring the you move first all the way to that card and there's nothing in between. This is in between. Nothing. And that's why it's difficult to describe whether you should follow the horse or the horse should follow you. But the idea must always be that it is the horse following the rider. 
So what I think quite often, this is kind of funny, or I think it's funny, which doesn't mean much. When I try to uh, trot, I think like this. I hold my hand here. I do not do this in my midsection. So I try to stay stable here, and I move through the hips, and I just jump forward. That's how I trot. Or at least that's what I like to think about that I look like when I trot. Or I don't like to, well, you get the point. The idea is that you need to jump forward as far as you want your horse to jump forward. And that's when the other side of power in the rider comes in. Because if you need to jump very far, or put it the other way, if the horse trots with a very strong stride forward, it is very difficult to, be, to stay upright without becoming after the movement of the horse. So you need to sort of jump forward as far as you want the horse to jump and keep jumping like that until you've done, you're done with that extension or that medium trot or that jousting pass or whatever you want to do. That's what you need to do. And you need that to keep happening all the time, no matter how difficult it becomes during the impact of the joust, which I, I don't know if anybody actually manages to do that. I, it's very difficult to see and I'm not sure anybody manages, but we'll, so maybe someone does or maybe someone will. Uh, or in an extended trot, if you become just a little bit stiff, the horse will run away from you. And then, the, then your butt starts bouncing just a little bit. But that bounce is enough for, for the connection from the bit to your heel to be gone. And that connection between your bit and your heel is what makes the horse collected from behind. That's why you need to not pull the leg up, but move the leg back. I often try to show that you need to move your knee out a little bit when you move forward. It's not because you need to get the knee away from the horse, but it is because you, don't, you need to not squeeze your knees together. Most people do, or mo I'm not saying most people, I am saying most people, but that's not what I mean. I mean quite a lot of riders that I see do that. So make sure that you don't pull your knees together when you ask the horse to go or that you pull your knees up. You need to get your knees out and what happens then is that your butt becomes engaged and then the next that becomes engaged is the backside of your thigh, your hamstrings, and then you need your calves to also aid in pushing off from the stirrup. That's how you sort of jump. You need to jump forward and that's how you jump forward and keep jumping forward. Right, that was the aids. Whew. Any questions? No questions from nobody? Yeah, the internet seems quite quiet. Oh well, the internet is very tired after several tough years on a, in a row now. <laughs> Nobody's got a question? All is crystal Try clear? I'm not patient. <laughs> you should all know. But what, what is this in uh, the Piaf or the Passant? All right. That is a, not like jumping forward, is it? Or Right. So the question uh, that I get from the room here is uh, how is the seat different in the Piaf and Passage as compared to uh, the extended or the medium trot, for instance, or even the working trot? Uh, and the seat works a little bit different in all those circumstances, but fundamentally it works the same way. It is important that we do, n I, for me, it is important when I teach that I try to never have the student think about slowing down or braking or any any stuff like that i do not want you to take away the power in the horse i do not want you to take, take the energy away i will not want you to stop the horse from doing anything at all what we want to do is direct the energy in some direction that works for us or for you or for what you're trying to do so what i think I think like this, and it, it, it's not difficult to think like that. It, it's moving like it isn't all that hard either, but making the horse move like that is pretty hard because it puts quite a lot of strain on the horse, and that is because you're asking quite a lot. So to extend the trot just a little, 
is something that young horses do fairly well. Even at an early stage, they can do that pretty well. And they can do that if you allow the frame to extend a bit. Because if you allow the head of the horse to go far away from the withers, then the weight of the head over the, over the height of the withers will counter the weight of the rider on the other side, sort of. Sort of. So uh, the shorter the horse is, the more the musculature must do the job instead of the ligament systems. So that's why it's difficult to make the horses collect properly. The second part of it, its difficulty is that most riders tend to not have power or in this case expressed as stability. Because I think about it like this. If I want the horse to trot at uh, a working trot, I move like this. This is how I think. I let my hips move forward up like this and then down and back and I keep moving like that all the time. If I want to extend the trot, I move more forward. So I elongate that movement. So it becomes a long oval. And uh, the weird thing about this long oval is that it isn't flatter. It might even be higher than the working trot. So the working trot is a fairly small circle and then I make an oval that is at least as high as this, this working trot. Maybe even higher, but it is also quite a lot longer. Because in order to jump a long distance, you also have to gain a lot of elevation and therefore you have to move up as well. But you have to think about moving forward if you want to extend the trot. The shorter the trot needs to be, the smaller I make the circle. But that's just a shorter trot. It does not gain any elevation, it's just shorter. It might even be lower, it's smaller in all directions. It just becomes this little movement inside the hip, little circle like that. And that little circle can be changed all the way down to, it becomes so small that it feels like, like, a, like, almost, a lot, like almost a sort of an, an, the number eight in three dimensions that moves something like this, a weird, weird little thing. It moves a little bit in both sides. And sometimes you have to give a little bit in your midsection, or at least I have to. Uh, I'm quite stable in my midsection, like compared to most riders. So, uh, so sort of that's my weakness and strength. I'm stable in the midsection. So maybe you have to think differently. But the idea is that I make a smaller circle to come down to a piaf. And then when the small circle is sort of as small as it can become, then I have to start thinking about like almost every other hip, just a little bit. And then if I want to have the horse do a good passage, then I change that circle from that small one and I start taking it up. So it's still very short, but it's now very high as well. So I sort of think about just jumping straight up, trying to get my whole body in that inside a tiny, tiny tube. Uh, well, <laughs> slightly tiny tube. <laughs> and I try to jump up and down inside there and then the horse brings him self up into a passage and quite often the passage will be limited to a fairly short stride. If it isn't a short stride, say about 30 centimeters, if it is longer than 30 centimeters, it is not likely to be a correct passage. As, because it is so extremely hard for the horse to jump from one diagonal straight up in the air and land on the next diagonal that it is quite rare that the horse goes above about 30 centimeters if it is to be a correct passage with power, with impulsion, the way we have it described here now. So that's mostly the aids that I think about when I want to do a passage. Normally the horse will be energetic enough, uh, so the short frame and your stability, because you're of course not moving your arm or arms as compared to your seat bones. Have a look at that next time you see yourself on the video. Is the elbow moving as compared, where the hell is the seat bone? In here somewhere, <laughs> is it moving like this or some such, this? If it does any of those, then you have an energy leak. And that means that some of the power you are, you actually 
could have had. And your horse leaks out through those those spaces and goes away and it doesn't become a proper collected strong powerful horse. Does that cover the aids? Does that make any clear clarity for you? Yes? Yes? Uh, Eva is asking how do I ask my horse to start the movement with its hind leg instead of its front leg? All right so the question is how to start the horse moving from the hind leg instead of moving off the front leg. Um, first, test it. You might have, she might have done this before, but quite a lot of people might not have tried that before. What you do is you just sit down on your horse, you try to think about these things about how the hell the hip should move and all that. Pardon my French. Uh, and then you, you try to put the leg on in, an, in a manner that doesn't block your hips from moving forward. This piece moving forward. Right? If you do that correctly, then the horse should, but probably won't, <laughs> move off of the hind leg. So what I do in order to enforce that is I take the stick with me and I turn around and I look at the leg I wanna, want to move and then I put my leg on and I, it's very difficult to say this quickly enough, but I put my leg on and then I touch the horse on that hind leg with the whip. Most horses respond with moving a little bit, no matter what you, how hard or whatever you touch. If it's very difficult to make the horse respond to the stick, then I go off the horse, I have the horse moving around me, so I hold one rein and I have the horse moving around me, and then I start touching the leg when it picks up off the ground. So just when it picks up, I touch the leg with the, with the stick, and after a while, the horse believes that Stick means it lifts the leg from the ground, and then it, start, it starts moving his leg in that, in that direction anyway, right? So what I do is first I test with my leg. If the horse doesn't move, then I use my stick. It's not any magic about it, uh, but um, there is quality in how you use that stick as well. You have to use it... You have to mean what you are trying to accomplish. So in, in this, these circumstances, when she's asking how I do this, she probably doesn't know how, what she's looking for when she's asking with the stick, right? And that leads to hesitation and then the horse is likely to not answer correctly. But keeping this in mind, it should be quite easily possible to, um, to allow for some error and some mistakes. It doesn't, it's no danger if you do something wrong other than if you're in the way and you're whipping your horse. Be careful. Use your, use your normal horse sense when doing these things. Don't get killed by your, your own horse. That's really, really not very good. Yep. Good question. Yes? What about uh, about down transition? Very often this happens. That is true. Down transitions are very difficult, quite so often. When the horse is running, um, how do you do that to make it out for down transition from the gantry? Yep. Yep. This is a very good question. How to make a uh, transition within these powerful parameters that we're trying to, uh, trying to establish here from canter. So uh, the first thing that needs to be est established then is that the canter needs to be correct from before. If it isn't, you can't do it. It's impossible. If the horse, if the canter is shit, then the transition will be the same quality. So first, you have to make sure that your horse is engaged from behind and that the back works the way it needs to and the horse comes forward and up to the bit. If the horse comes forward and up to the bit, what I do is when the horse horse's hind legs lift off from the ground, I put my legs on to the best of my abilities. I squeeze on and I move through the hip, but not far. I move up. And what happens then is the horse swings his hind legs under and now you have prepared, prepared properly for a down transition. Sometimes you will have to have several strides most times. You will have, need to have several strides to do this properly. But a proper down transition 
should be possible to do from any speed at canter during one stride of canter. I believe this is said in Garnier's book. That is a halt, not a half halt, but a proper halt. So I put my legs on a whole lot and I don't let go. Like I don't release any of that until the horse is still. But that release needs to happen while the horse becomes still. Uh, I know there have been pictures of this on my Facebook page at least, and uh, maybe on Trollspile page too. There's uh, images of uh, me and Ares doing such a transition. There's a video of you and him. That uh, also true. Okay. Yeah. It's really, really difficult. Really, let's put it this way. It's really difficult to do that with the correct quality. But it is easily possible to make your horse stop dead just with a big bit. <laughs> that can be done. If, if the horse has respect for the bit, you can stop the horse with the bit only, uh, especially if you have a saddle with a high back cantle. In that case, you can put so much strain on the back cantle and not allow the horse to lift his head, so the horse must stop the stride, unless you start bouncing so much that he can keep con continue running. But it is possible to do it that way. Don't do it, but it is possible. So sometimes you may fool yourself with that. If it feels hard, it is hard. If it feels soft, it is correct. Right? If it feels hard though, it might be you. It doesn't have to be the horse doing the wrong thing. It might be you. So just pay attention. Right? Yes? Um, many people say that you should uh, squeeze with your knees to stop the horse. Yes. Is that power? If you, if you squeeze with your knees, then the horse will respond with squeezing with the muscles that lie beneath your knees. That will be something like the lats. The lats are prime movers of the front legs. If they become tight, the horse will easily be able to stop, but it will always then stop on the forehand. Always. That means that you have... It's like... Uh, that's like stopping while, if you put your car in, in neutral and then stop, then you will have to put it in gear again and, and all that jazz to start going. While if you engage the hindquarters with your lower leg instead and release the upper leg, then the horse will be able to rise up through the withers and that allows the horse to stay soft and fluid through the shoulders while remaining active from behind. So in that manner, you will be able to keep the power on tap all the time. And this is why this power thing that I've been talking about, probably why it is called impulsion when you read about it in the riding literature. Because impulsion implies that it is something that's always there. If you manage to do it correctly, it will always be there. It's like having, it's like a spring that you load just a little bit it's always ready. Whenever you let go, it goes, <coughs> but it stays smooth, calm, and all that. So it's always on tap. For instance, here's a trick I've done with, uh, on the, when I've been doing clinics sometimes. Um, if uh, there's a lot of people who doubt whatever I'm doing, which they are entitled to, of course, uh, I will sometimes find a horse that has a fairly good canter but is definitely weaker to one side. I will then sit up on that horse and canter him to that side. And then I'll do half a pirouette on that side, even if that horse has never ever done half a pirouette anyway, at any time. And I will almost always be able to do that half a pirouette, and then I'll just jump off the horse and be done with it. This is a trick. What I'm doing is a pirouette without impulsion. And that is shown by it just being half a pirouette, and then I can't ride on from there. I would have to restart the whole bloody horse to get going at all. You can do that too. It is possible to just restart it. And quite often you can see when people do transitions between Piaf and Passage, it looks like you have to restart the horse in between those two gates. And it should be fluid. That's why it's called impulsion. 
It is a thing that's always ready. You wind it up a little bit, but not enough to make it tense, just enough to have power to move all the time. In order to do that, you can never be tense yourself. If you are tense, the horse is tense. There is no two ways about that. It can be good enough, of course, anyway. But that is a truth that we need to deal with. Does that explain what you asked? Yes. So don't squeeze your knees. Just never ever do it. Uh, do it if you fall off otherwise. But that's it. Do you ride with impulsion in, in walk or do you, and why? Or what's the purpose right. for you? Yeah. Uh, this is a very, very good question. Uh, do you ride with impulsion in walk? It is said that uh, it is much easier to have impulsion at the trot and at the canter because there is some time in the air. And while the horse is in the air, you can load that spring. It is easier to load the spring when you're airborne or at least one whole diagonal is airborne. Then it's, you have natural impulsion. In my opinion, it is extremely difficult to ride with impulsion or power at the walk. But I think it is even harder to learn it at the trot or at the canter. That's my own private opinion, uh, public opinion, sorry. <laughs> my own public opinion. Um, but I think it is uh, extremely difficult to learn the correct thing at the trot or at the canter. You can but it is hard. It is hard because the more violent, the more powerful the movement is, and the trot is obviously more powerful than the walk, and the canter can be even more powerful than the trot again, the more power there is in the horse's movement, the more something you'll have to have as a rider as well. You will have to be more balanced, or stronger, or uh, more dexter. You have to be better at what you're doing in order to do it with more power. That being said, sometimes that added power is exactly what you need to learn it. So <laughs> don't be afraid to try anything. I'm not trying to stop you from doing anything. I'm just telling what I'm trying to accomplish. So what I do at what I try to show here when we start at the walk, I want the horse to start like this. When it has, I ride with impulsion. When it does, if it does this correctly, I ride with impulsion, right? That is sort of a part of at least the definition of impulsion, that the horse starts from behind. If it does, then you have loaded the top line, hind leg moves under, that loads the whole top line, that springs the horse forward. And you keep moving that way, right? So that's the idea. It is extremely difficult to do. And quite often you will see that horses move, if you look at the horse moving around you on the circle, at the walk, the, the walk will look four beat, regular, looks just great. And then you stop and start from the halt again, and the horse moves front leg first, and it keeps moving front leg first. What happens then is that you unload the top ridge, so you can never regain the tension, the positive tension through the top line to be able to call it impulsion, right? So you try to ride with impulsion, but when the impulsion is on such a low level, you might call it rhythm, you might call it looseness, you might call it contact. So if you get those three things correct at the walk, and the rhythm includes, it needs to start with the right leg. You can't start on the wrong one. If you start on the front leg, the rhythm is wrong. Even if you just, if you, uh, you're not watching, and then all of a sudden you're watching a horse, it is extremely difficult to ascertain whether it is moving hind leg first or front leg first. Mm -hmm. That depends on what you're looking at. If the first leg you look at is the front leg, then that moves first. If the first leg you look at is the hind leg, then that moves first. But the question is, did he start off with the hind leg first, or did he? You have to find out. That's why I say, find that out first, and then you will know. 
So this is a thing everybody needs to think about at least if you want to be able to ride with proper impulsion and proper power. But would you say that riding with power and impulsion is the same as riding with energy? Uh, I might say that. <laughs> of course, the question but... Is. Um, the question is, uh, would you say that riding with power and impulsion is the same, same as riding with energy? Uh, and I say, I might say that, but uh, energy is just a piece of power and impulsion. Power is even just one piece of impulsion. And impulsion, as stated about riding in all the different riding texts you can find, is quite a complex, uh, what do you call it, one complex big issue all by itself. So, energy is a part of power and therefore also a part of impulsion. Yes? Um, so, we've been going for about an hour now. Yeah. Um, and there are no other questions pending. No. So, I was wondering uh, when we will be doing this again? That's a good question. When will we be doing this again? This is, of course, putting me on the spot just in front of the camera live. Thank you very much, Eva. That's very much appreciated. <laughs> Um, we will uh, try to do this at least every other week. Uh, it is uh, not set in stone which weekday this will be uh, yet. Uh, that's because uh, normally I will not be at home at this time on a Sunday. I will be either driving or flying somewhere or rotting in a hotel or something. So uh, I'm not sure which day, but at least every other week we want to try and do something like this. Uh, we want also very much, as you have heard several times tonight, we very much want questions from the audience. Um, therefore, uh, we will not put any limits on questions for the first, for the first or next uh, session. So whatever you want to ask us about, ask us to talk about at length, <laughs> which we will happily do. Um, just send us a question. Send us a question in Norwegian, send us one in English, and if you're of any other nation and need to speak in other languages, you can try that too, but I can guarantee nothing. So any question about riding or um, training for riding or the horse or whatever is uh, just a go for the next session. Yep. So if there's... Uh, We'll give it another couple minutes to see if anybody has gathered the yeah, strength. Yeah. I'll have, I have you there. I'll um, still give you guys a couple minutes to gather your strength to see if you have any questions that you want to help us with. Uh, and um, before those two minutes have passed, I will ask here for the question you had. No, but it's from. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia Skotnes is asking, when you say you always need to start with a hind leg, is it not possible when riding to fix this along the way? Is it possible to get the energy from behind again while riding? Right. Um, first, to answer this question perfectly, I think is impossible. At least I can't do it. But what I can say is that if you want to fix the rhythm on the fly, then you will have to, let's say, it's like, uh, it's like if, you're, uh, if you're marching alongside someone or even if you're uh, uh, walking hand in hand with someone. You, sh you need to walk in the same rhythm, right? And if you aren't, the only way to fix that is to do a quick uh, uh, change of lead, right? So you have to do a jump over. Have you ever done that at the walk? That's my first question. <laughs> that is really difficult to do at the walk. Uh, you can do it at the canter, but then you just change the lead. So the, quest the question is, I, I would answer it, I personally will answer it in the negative. No, I don't think it is. It still happens, but it is extremely difficult to change that on purpose. Uh, quite often you will, the horse will change out of the correct rhythm but it is not often the horse changes into the correct rhythm 
unless, of course, the horse is very well trained from before. That's what I would say to that question. Any ideas? No? Yeah, the other one's saying no. Yeah. Uh, Hege Herbe is asking again, what should I look for or feel for to find out if I'm able to get a bit power when I'm riding on my own? All right. A little bit of power when you're riding on your own. Uh, you'll have to check if your horse lifts his or her, her I think, head up to the bit. If the horse stays behind the vertical to any extent or doesn't want to lift forward into your hand so that you get contact so that the horse searches for the contact of your hand, that is one thing. If the horse comes forward to the contact without pulling hard, without becoming harsh in the, in the hand, that's likely to be some, some sort of power, a bit of it, some of it, a little bit of it, or just a piece of power, maybe. Uh, other things you can, uh, um, can uh, search for is, like um, Espen said here earlier, it feels like you're floating or it feels effortless. Because the, the hard part is to get there. When you're there, it's easy. When you're in power and in balance, it feels like you can do anything. You can just float around and do whatever you like. So all sorts of, if you feel powerful and at home in it, then it's power. If you are a little bit afraid, then it is probably a little bit too much tension for your own good at the moment. So those are things. O other things uh, that you can feel for is, is the horse pushing the back cantle of the saddle up towards your butt? That's a thing that you often can feel. When the horse pushes your butt forward a little bit. That is a sign of power. It doesn't need to be. You, you can feel that even wrongly, but if it pushes your butt, you're probably good. We're probably good. So those are some ideas to look for in order to feel the power. Uh, as Hege well knows, my, my um, um, best qualities do not include telling you how it should feel. They tell you what you should do, and then Hanna will tell you what to feel. <laughs> yep. So, are there any further questions? Uh, just one more. Oh yeah. If your legs are are at different length, uh, how would you adjust the stirrups? If you have two different legs, they're not even. If your legs are not even, then go to a doctor and get them X-rayed. Measure up whether the bones are actually a different length or not. Most likely they are. In that case, gain mobility so that both your legs become the same length. Uh, changing the stirrups in order to accommodate for your legs being different because you are stiff on one side, strong on one side, weak on one side, whatever it is, is probably not going to get you anywhere. Um, granted, if it is uh, a problem that you are A, aware of, that it is a muscular problem, and B, you uh, it is a very pronounced problem. You might have to adjust for it for a while because overcompensating will lead to further injury or such, further problems at least. So that's the best I can answer that question. You have time for more? Of course. Uh, do you use the expression in front of the leg to describe power? Uh, personally, I don't often use that expression. However, I think it is uh, it, it is fairly accurate, um, but it, it's impossible for me to say that other people's use of the expression in front of the leg will express what I mean about power. I can't do that, but just judging from what in front of the leg might mean, yes, the horse needs to be in front of the leg, and then the question is, what the hell does in front of the leg mean? I have done my, what I can to explain the power thing, and if you are 
left with a lot of questions about it, then I've done my job because this is such a complex subject that I can't for the life of me be able to, uh, to express everything about it in one lesson in one hour. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Um, then I think that with that we will just uh, round it off and uh, say thank you all, all so very much for joining us in this uh, theory exhibition. And I hope you will join us later, most likely on a weekday, most likely in about two weeks' time. Thank you very much. <laughs>